um, are the reasons for not speaking of the forms of the fourfold assembly is that the views of an ordinary person are often wrong. Ordinary people cannot fathom the realms of centuries. Bodhisattvas of the first ground, for example, do not know the states of those of the second ground, and so on up the line. Bodhisattvas on the tenth ground do not know the states of the Bodhisattva on the ground of equal enlightenment. Ahas of the first fruition do not know the states of second fruition ahas. Before you acquire true wisdom, you may not say harmful things about the fourfold assembly, which is one form of slandering the triple jewel. Even though people may very clearly be in the wrong, you should not speak of it. Just do things correctly yourself, rather than acting like a camera that goes about photographing phones and never is mining itself. At this point, some stories come to mind. During the reign of Emperor Wu of the Liang Dynasty, there was a Jiana master named Chu Kung who ate two pigeons every day. The cook assumed that the birds must be delicious and one day tasted a wing on the sly. Then he brought the remainder of the dish to Diana Master Chu Kung. After, after he finished eating, Diana Master Chu Kung called for the cook. Why did you eat some of my pigeons? I didn't take any pigeon, answered the cook. Oh, then what about this? said Diana Master Chu Kung. He opened his mouth and two live pigeons emerged. One of the birds flew off, but the other had a wing missing. If you didn't, where's the wing of this bird? asked Diana Master Chu Kung. Also in both cases, the man ate pigeons. Diana Master Chu Kung swallowed the chopped up and cooked pigeon and spit it out alive. The cook, on the other hand, could not do it. Diana Master Chu Kung's state was one of eating and yet not eating. A Lingying monastery at West Lake Hang Chou. There lived Diana Master Chi Gung, another famous monk who always ate dog meat and drank wine. He was uh, invariably inebriated, and everyone said, There goes another tippling monk in his drunkenness. However, Chi Gung touched and transformed living beings. Once a Buddha image was not yet guided with gold, so he told the abbot, I will guide this Buddha image. No one else needs to do it. The abbot of his temple agreed and then waited. After some time, the image was still not finished, so the abbot questioned Diana Master Chi Kung about the matter. The dinner master agreed to do the work that very evening. When night came, however, he merely kept on with his drinking. When everyone was asleep, though, he went to the image and began to spool forth the pure gold with which he covered the images. The abbot heard Diana Master Chi Kung spitting and abruptly ordered, How could you spit at the Buddha image? Diana Master Chi Kung immediately quit and left. The next morning, the abbot inspected the image. He found that it was covered with gold except for a small spot on the crown of the head. Although the master goldsmith completed the work, his ordinary gold could not match that supplied by Diana Master Chi Kung. The states of our hearts are inconceivable. So you see, you should not speak of the forms of the fourfold assembly. It is not so serious if you criticize ordinary people, but should you criticize a sage, the penalty you might incur will be very great enough to cause you to fall into the house. People slander the triple jewel because they do not have faith. Another cause is mixing with bad company, people who do not understand and therefore slander the Buddha drama. Associating with such people may cause one to be influenced by their bad habits. Some people berate and slander the triple jewel and use flattery for ill gain. Such persons' minds are crooked. They engage in flattery to get what they want. 
they are stupid yet puffed up with their own intelligence. Like the 5,000 bishops who left the assembly during the speaking of the Lotus Sutra. Because they had a tiny bit of cleverness, they looked down on others and slandered the good Dharma, thus blinding the selective Dharma eyes of living beings. What is the retribution for such persons? In the future, they will be deformed and crippled without arms, hands, ears, or legs. They may not be able to walk or have some speech impediment. Mules are people who slandered the triple jewel. After they commit this offense, they fall into their house, where they spend two million years of hellish retribution, after which they are born into the realms of the animals, possibly as a horse, cow, sheep, chicken, or dog. After two million years among the animals, they may be reborn as humans, but they will be disabled. Either they will be without eyes, therefore blind, without ears, therefore deaf, or perhaps without tongues, or even with tongues, but yet they cannot speak. In general, they will be disabled and ugly. They undergo this kind of suffering and fall into the relentless hells after death. Such is the retribution of slandering the triple jewel in life's past. And do not venerate sutras. Sutras must be treated with respect for, as it says in the Diamond Sutra, wherever this sutra is, there is a Buddha. Sutras are the Dharma body of the Buddha, toward which we must be very respectful. Places where sutras are said must be organized and clean and without acts of defilement. They should always be stored above other books. Also, make sure that Buddhist sutras are on the side where they lay our head in a room and not on the side where they lay our feet. Our beds are unclean, so sutras must not be placed there. If you do not show the same respect for sutras that you show the Buddha, you are slandering and harming the triple jewel. The retribution for not respecting sutras is the same. One falls into the relentless whole hell where for thousands of billions of ants they will seek escape in vain. It would be impossible to exit the house, the house despite such a long duration. Remember this section of the sutra, especially it is very important. Buddhists must be respectful of the triple jewel and sutras must and must not shed the Buddha's blood. Sutra Beings who stop or damage the property of the eternal dwelling, who defy bishops or bishonis, who commit sexual acts within the Sangharama, or who kill or harm beings there, will fall into the relentless hell, where for thousands of billions of ends they will seek escape in vain. Commentary Beings who stop or damage the property of the eternally dwelling. Eternally dwelling is the way place. There are four kinds of eternally dwelling. The permanent eternally dwelling, the eternally dwelling of the ten directions, the current eternally dwelling, and the current eternally dwelling of the ten directions. One, the permanent eternally dwelling. This way place is fixed and continuous within which monastics permanently reside. A way place is where the Sangha lives. To absorb and destroy the eternally dwelling is to make use of the food, drink, and goods of those permanently dwelling in the temples without offering compensation. Lay people who live in a temple must donate to a temple. If you live in a temple even for a few days and do not offer a monetary contribution, you absorb the goods of those permanently dwelling there. This offense will certainly send you to the house. You should regard living in a temple as being similar to living anywhere else. You should pay for living expenses that approximate the amount of living elsewhere. Thus, avoid stealing from those permanently dwelling there. I tell my refuge disciples to make sure they never commit this offense, but always have 
the way place. If you cannot augment the resources of a place, you should at least make sure that you do not deplete them. People who do not understand any Buddhist principles think they are getting a bargain by living in a temple for free. This may be fine if you do not understand how to act properly, but if you understand the Buddha drama and still behave that way, it is quite another. This principle holds true not only for lay people, but for those who have left home life as well. Anywhere I go to stay long term as a monk, I will pay half of the estimated cost for spending the night at a nearby hotel. E.g., I pay $3 for an approximated charge of $5. Wherever I go, I do this unless I have absolutely nothing, then that is okay. If I do have something, I will not accept, use up or demit the property of the eternally dwelling. Since the eternally dwellings like the great earth where a great assembly may live, we must take care not to drain the supplies, such as depleting the food supply, so that derive others of it. That would be an offense. If I alone starve to death, that will be no problem, but I cannot deprive the assembly of its food. The eternally dwelling monastics must have food and offerings, unlike my little disciple who can do without. Food is like the sky overhead, we need it. So we hurt the eternally dwelling if we leave nothing for them. With this attitude, you will not commit a grave offense in this area. For those of us who have studied the Buddha drama, we need to make a donation to the temple. Even if it's a little less than the payment at other places, at least you have done your best. You give none and then run away is to absorb or damage the property of the eternally dwelling. 2. The eternally dwelling of the ten directions. It is a place where any member of the Sangha from any place may stay. 3. The current eternally dwelling. The people who are currently living here are referred to as the current eternally dwelling. 4. The current eternally dwelling of the ten directions. This refers to the actual property left by deceased Sangha members, which may be divided among the Sangha members of the ten directions. The difference that is that goods of the current eternally dwelling are only available to those living here. Temporarily, those who come afterwards do not have a share, whereas that of the current eternally dwelling of the ten directions is available to all, those who come earlier and later. Who defined Vishus or Vishunis, some brutes, haras, and rape nuns? They commit offenses. Who commits sexual acts within the Saharama? The Saharama is a still pure place, in other words, any Buddhi mandala or temple. No one should be indulgent or unruly by engaging in sexual activity at any Saharama or any place where there is a Buddha image. A man who suffered from a genital ulcer once asked Mahamaud Galyayana the origin of his disease and was told, in your past life, you wantonly engaged in sexual activity in the Saharama. Having committed this offense, your male genital often festers with sores. Although he was speaking to a man, the principle is the same for women. Anyone who violates this rule will in the future be born in the house. After being in the house, they will be reborn and their genitals will often grow ulcers. These diseases are incurable. To cause and effect of these causes and conditions must be believed. If you do not believe in the future, you will undergo the retribution or who kill or harm beings there, those who murder or hurt the victim of an unsuccessful rape attempt, will fall into the relentless hell, where for thousands of billions of ants they will seek escape in vain. Some people discover that the more they study Buddhism, the more inconvenient things become. 
the more they practice, the less freedom they enjoy. When you do not study the Buddha Dharma, constraints come later. Now, however, constraints occur in the present. We increase our good rules when we study the Buddha Dharma now. We increase our karmic obstructions when we do not study the Buddha Dharma. Constraints associated with those are forever. When you study Buddhism, you may be limited for a while, but this restraint is relatively short-lived. If you do not want perpetual freedom, you do not need to study Buddhism. If you want freedom in the future, you may want to accept a little less freedom in the meantime. The restraints of studying the Buddha Dharma are short-term by comparison, and if you refuse to do so, your restraints will be lasting. Weigh the odds for yourself.